Dr. David Peralta. David earned his bachelor and master degree in chemistry at the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. Uh, there, he also taught a few undergraduate courses in chemistry, molecular biology, and modules about science and society. In 2009, he moved to Heidelberg in Germany to work at the German Cancer Research Center and at the University of Heidelberg, where he got his PhD in biology while working on redox biochemistry in the lab of Professor Tobias Dick. In 2014, he began working as an assistant editor at Wiley for the journal Chemistry Open, Chemistry Select, and, Medchem, and ChemMedChem. He also been the editor-in-chief of ChemMedChem since 2017. Aside from running ChemMedChem, he also gives numerous workshops internationally on all topics related to scientific publishing and communication. So, David, please, I leave the floor to you. Thank you for having me. Let me share my screen quickly. I think the, maybe the microphone is a little bit low. Does this work? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I hope this is fine. Um, thank you for having me again. Um, today, uh, so after all of the, the, the scientific talks, we're going to move into another part uh, that's important in your, in your academic and scientific careers as well, which is science writing and science communication. So what we're going to go through um, in the next 40 minutes or so is uh, for me to give you some, some tips on, on scientific writing, primarily going through what I feel are five good rules to remember when writing uh, scientific academic work. So what are the five rules? We'll go straight to the point. The first rule is knowing your audience. You need to know your audience. The second rule is KISS, K-I-S-S. -S. What does that mean? We'll go through it in a while. Then the third rule is let your story guide you. The fourth rule is to please your readers. And the fifth rule is to be confident. So let's go through the rules one by one. The first rule is to know your audience. And a lot of communicators in any field, not just in science, will say that this is, this is the prime rule in communication, to think of your audience and to know your audience. When you think of your audience, you're asking yourself, who is my audience? Who am I talking to? Who is going to read this piece of work? That should determine where you publish, what and how you write, and how you frame and sell your story. What do we mean exactly by this? When you think about your audience, it can help you decide where you publish. Unfortunately, it's not just about impact factor. We're just not here to publish work in the journal with the highest impact factor. The more important thing in your goal in science writing and writing a paper is to find the right audience. That is for your paper to be read and hopefully eventually cited by the right people, by the right community. And so always ask yourself, who should read my paper? As a good example, in medicinal chemistry and pharmaceutical chemistry, you can have different kinds of audiences for your paper. Are you targeting synthetic chemists to read your paper? Are you looking for the chemical biologists? Are you looking for clinicians? Are you looking for pharmacologists? And depending on whom you want to read your paper, that should shape how, how you write it and your content and what you emphasize in the paper. And at the same time, where you actually send that piece of work. You should ask yourself, who are the editors reading my paper? What are they doing? Are they active researchers? What are their specializations? Ask yourself to where will it get the best visibility in your field? Which journals have you enjoyed reading? Which journals have been most helpful to you? All of these questions together, when you, when you answer them, you are thinking of your audience and it should help you decide where you publish your work and at the same time help shape the content of your work to reach those target people best way that you can. When you think of your audience, it should also help you write better. You need to remember that you yourselves form the audience of other writers, of other scientists, and what others want to read is the same thing as what you want to read. And so your goal should be clear, direct, and concise writing to please those readers, similar in a similar way that you want to read good things when you look for, for scientific literature online. In your entire career as researchers, whether you're, you're a senior professor right now or a postdoc 
a postdoctoral researcher or a PhD student or a master's student, you will have read by now a lot of science papers. And in all of those papers that you've read, you will probably recall at least one paper wherein you, you would just stop reading it and ask yourself, how the hell was this published in the first place? Whenever you're reading something like that and you encounter a bad paper like that, remember those horrible papers and don't do the same thing. Okay? Do not propagate a bad culture of communication and writing because the same thing will happen when other people read your papers. So ask yourself all the time, what frustrates you as a reader? Okay? Think of yourself as an audience member of others. Then do the opposite. Don't do the same thing and don't propagate the same bad practices. And ask yourself as well, have I made my story clear? Okay? If your story, if your take-home message is clear, then that will also be clear for your readers and that will make it a more satisfactory and more complete read. We also need to have a good idea of how people read nowadays. And this is something that we're going to go through when we discuss rule number four. So rule number one, think of your audience, can help you decide where you send it and how it, the content of it, and it can help you write better. Rule number two is KISS. Not kissing per se, but KISS as an acronym. And KISS is known uh, in a lot of, of writing and, and in grammar circles as keep it short and simple or keep it simple stupid. Okay? It's a nice acronym to remember to keep things short and simple. This is a nice quote that I really like from George Bernard Shaw saying that the biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And more often than not, you have the illusion that communication has taken place, but not really when you overcomplicate things. So the simpler and the more direct things are, the better it is in terms of communication and final understanding. There's a nice study way back from 2005, 2006, uh, in the journal Applied Cognitive Psychology, and this is the title of the paper. It says, consequences of erudite vernacular utilized irrespective of necessity, problems with using long words needlessly. So the title itself demonstrates what the paper is all about. And what this paper says, main take home message is that there's a negative relationship between complexity of a text and judged intelligence of the author. And that needless complexity leads to negative evaluations. Simply said, the more complicated you sound, the dumber people think you are. And so it's counterintuitive, and a lot of people think that using flowery language all the time and really long sentences and paragraphs makes it better and makes them look intelligent when it's the, the contrary. And so it takes more effort and more practice to be able to say something concisely and directly in a simple way than to overcomplicate things. And this is one thing that you need to remember and you need to keep on practicing. Keep it simple. So when discussing now this rule, we're going to go through two main lines. One is to use simple words and phrases. And the second set uh, of, of exercises we're going to do is to consider simple sentence structure. And by this, I mean using the active voice. So in the next few slides, we're gonna go through something like an interactive, as interactive as possible, a virtual workshop. Uh, we're gonna go through some examples and then take a few pauses and you can answer some of the, the questions and the problems yourselves at home. And we're gonna go through the answers along uh, together. Uh, in the next examples too, you're gonna see that we're, gonna, we're going through a lot of detail and nuance in terms of writing and grammar. One thing you need to remember is this is something that you need to do not while you're writing, but already after you've written something. There's a nice quote from John Dufresne saying that the purpose of the first draft is not to get it right, but to get it written. So write whatever you need to write first, write all of the data, write all your results, write your paper, and then go back at it and check your writing and see how you can polish it using these tips that we're going to go through right now. So first is simple words and phrases. What we mean here is we want you to use familiar and not complex words. We want shorter words if there's a shorter, better option for it. We want single words versus long, complicated phrases that go round and round, circumlocutions. And we want concrete words instead of abstract words. And this will all contribute to keeping it short and simple. So first exercise, you're gonna encounter a lot of these uh, words. We, we use them now and then, and that's fine. Um, but if you use them again and again, you need to be careful because there are shorter, simpler words that you can use. So instead of saying we utilize, you can 
use use. Okay? Instead of saying sufficient, okay? something is sufficient, it's enough. Okay? We discontinued the use of blah, blah, blah. We stopped. Okay? The next one, ameliorate, is a bit more complicated. We don't use it that often, but to ameliorate means to make something better, to improve. Okay? Subsequently, you can say next. Okay? The magnitude of something is the size, or you can even say exactly what the size of something is. Demonstrates, we demonstrated, blah, blah, blah. We showed something to quantify is to measure. So again, it's fine to use a mix of words, but the moment you catch yourself using more complicated words just for the sake of using them, be very careful of that. Another thing that we want to avoid is wordiness or circumlocutions or phrases that go round about, beat around the bush. We want to be direct in our writing. And again, in spoken language and in some writing, this is okay to use, but the moment you catch yourself clinging onto these as crutches, stop and simplify things. In view of the fact that, okay, in view of the fact that A, then B, that is because, okay, there's a certain amount of you can say some, this has the potential to, can, could, may, okay? prior to, you can use before. Okay? At present time, saying at present time, you can use now. It's in parentheses because if you're emphasizing now an era, okay? a time, a specific time period or an era, then it's common to use at present time, that's fine. During the time that, Okay, when, while, okay, as something is happening. The question as to whether, the question as to whether A is going to happen depends on B. It is a if or when, okay, if, conditional. A majority of, okay, most, a number of, can be many, can be few, okay? So it's a bit vague. So you wanna be specific when, when you're, you're discussing that. And so you can even use this specific number that you're talking about are of the same opinion. A and B are of the same opinion. A agrees with B, or A and B agree. Something is less frequently occurring. Okay. It happens rarely or seldom. A gives rise to B. Okay. Something is cause and effect, so A causes B, causes. Due to the fact that okay, A then B, again, it is because it's a cause and effect thing, has an effect on, a affects B. And based on the assumption that, okay, that is again something that is conditional. You have an assumption, it's conditional. Anything that's conditional, you can likely simplify with if. Okay? Unless you're emphasizing the statement that it is a key assumption, then you can use the word assumption. So again, this is fine in language and in writing now and then, but do not cling on to them just to expand your writing and to think that it makes it better because you can use simpler direct things. Avoid redundancy. So large in magnitude, you know, something large is already in magnitude, something completely finished. You don't need to say that. We tried and endeavored, you know, we estimated at about a successful solution, solution. We illustrated and demonstrated the challenges and difficulties. You know, we use this sometimes in conclusions or in introductions. Uh, this is all fluff. Right? Avoid redundancy and be direct. Okay. Um, another another good practice that a lot of writers will push is to use uh, verbs. And in writing, in in any kind of writing. Uh, we always think of verbs as nice, juicy words. They, they're, they're the sexy parts of language because they denote action. There's movement, uh, and, and we like that. We like reading that. And so beware of using uh, nouns when you can use verbs. And a lot of times this happens in these S-I-O-N or T-I-O-N, the shun words. So instead of saying make a decision, you can use the verb form of that and say decide. Okay? Take into consideration you can consider. To give an explanation, you can explain. Okay? A is indicative of something, then it indicates. Okay? To make an estimate of, obviously, estimates it comes to the realization. We have come to the realization, and just say we realized that. Okay? So beware of, of using nouns, these, these substantive forms, and use uh, verb forms whenever you can. Put the action in, in your sentences.
Uh, a lot of scientists' favorites are using uh, it is or there is or there are. It is noteworthy that, it is well known, it can be regarded, blah, 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 in recent years. Although this is fine to use, you know, a few times, uh, avoid using them again and again. Because typically you can use simpler words like notably, interestingly, and they don't add uh, many things. Uh, using there are, there is, there were a few, there are many, and so on. Uh, often when you reread that sentence, there Actually, you, you don't need uh, there is or there are. You can go directly to the point. Uh, and this is hard to catch. Uh, and this is why you need to, to try it again and again. And you only look at it after you've written something. So beware of these, these favorites uh, to try to make your language simpler. Uh, how about jargon and acronyms? Uh, jargon is technical language, uh, technical terms uh, that we use often as science writers. Uh, and acronyms are these. Uh, shortened uh, phrases. Uh, we use it for protocols or, or, or different names, uh, biological samples, cells, for instance. Um, they're okay to use, but you need to be wary of using them. When you use jargon, you want to minimize the use of jargon in these technical terms, particularly for parts of your paper uh, that are more accessible to the general public and, and a lot of people will be able to read. Like your titles, your abstracts, your table of content or graphical texts. Uh, try to minimize them. Uh, use the ones that are most common. Uh, and also for acronyms, when you're going to use them, use the most common ones. Define them if they're not uncommon. So if not that, if they're not that common. So for instance, when you write DNA or RNA, a lot of people will know what that is. You know, PCR, depending on your audience again, where you're publishing it, uh, and where it's written. Is it a press release? Is it a tweet? Or so on. You may want to to define some of these things. How about creating new acronyms, creating new things for your papers? And this is something that a lot of scientists like doing. Uh, because it can be fun and you can introduce something new that a lot of people, you know, if it's successful, that they, it'll eventually be adapted. Uh, this is fine, but you need to be careful that you're not just doing it for the sake of fun and that you're not doing it as an overkill. There's a really nice article from Derek Lowe uh, in his article uh, in his um, a series on the pipeline uh, that he published last year about acronym fever. So we need an acronym for that. Uh, and in this article, he discusses you know th this interesting practice of like, a lot of, of uh, biologists and chemists do in creating new acronyms for different things and what is really pushing the, the uh, going past the line and pushing the limit uh, in terms of creating acronyms. Uh, and we see this all the time. You know, sometimes it works. So for instance, when we see, uh, when we have the term proteolysis targeting chimeras or avian myelocytomasis virus oncogene cellular homologue, we don't see this as often anymore, but we do know now about Protax, and that's, that rings a bell, that's familiar, and CMYK. Uh, so for, for this particular gene, we probably don't even use avian myelocytomasis virus oncogene cellular homologue anymore, but we know what we mean, uh, what is meant when someone writes CMYK. And Protax was also something that did not exist before. It was invented as an acronym that became popular, and that's one of the more successful ones. But so you need to be very careful with that. Uh, another example I like using, uh, they, they love these acronyms in the analytical chemistry and the NMR community, for instance. So they use it for their experiment names. So incredible natural abundance double quantum transfer experiment and insensitive nuclei enhanced by polarization transfer is inadequate and inept. They go together. Uh, they have homonuclear Hartman hand spectroscopy, that's ho ha ha, spin echo correlated spectroscopy, they shorten spectroscopy as SY, so that's sexy. Um, this is an example that, uh, that Derek made for, for the article in the pipeline. It's orally available transition state mimic effective adenosine ligand, oatmeal, and that's an example of pushing it. You know, it's overkill. It's fun, but it's overkill. You're doing it for this, that sake. Uh, and there was this one paper that tried to push this acronym, Proton Enhanced Nuclear Induction Spectroscopy. I'm not even going to uh, define what that is. You can, you can guess what that is for yourself. So Jargon and acronyms, they are okay. Minimize their use. Don't just use them for the sake of using them and for fun. I mean, they need to have a purpose and needs to push something important. Okay, in terms of optimizing content uh, and keeping things simple, you want to keep your sentence structure simple. And to do that, a good way is to use the active voice. The active voice is okay when writing your scientific papers. So when you use the active voice, we use it primarily when we describe, in the introduction, when we describe results, when we, when we have a discussion of the work. Um, we is okay. You need to take ownership of your work. And I go through um, 
the historical feature of that later, but this is okay, using we is okay in your results and your discussion. Why is this important in terms of communication? Because structurally, the passive voice will put the subject too far away from their verbs. So take a look at this example sentence. The direct benefits to pregnant women who receive the drug and the indirect benefits to the fetus as a result of the lowered blood pressure are reported in our clinical trial. By the end of that sentence, uh, you may have forgotten what, what it was talking about and what it was about, but if you structure it this way in active form, our clinical trial reports the direct benefits to pregnant women who receive the drugs and the indirect benefits, blah, 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 and so on. So the active voice is good because it keeps the subject and the verbs close together, and it also follows closely and complements really well the way we think and the way we process information in lists, especially if that will end up as a long sentence. So try to use the active voice. When do we use the passive voice? The most common time when we use the, act, uh, the, the passive voice in a scientific paper is in the method section and only to emphasize certain points. There are a few more times when we can use the passive voice. Uh, and this is from, from the Duke Scientific Writing Resource Center. Uh, and they, 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 they summarize it really well. The first is if the performer is unknown, irrelevant, or obvious. Okay, so for example, the first version of this study was attempted in 1875. You don't need to know who made it. If you want to emphasize when it was done, then you can use the passive voice. If the action is more important than the performer, and this is why we use the past passive uh, tense in, uh, in the experimental section and the method section, because we emphasize the action there, the, the, the experimental action. And also we try to, because every sentence is a specific method and specific action, we try to, use, uh, we try to avoid using we again and again, again. okay? Uh, also to position more important information at the start of the sentence. So to emphasize the recipient, so take a look at these two sentences. Green plants produce the carbohydrates in the presence of light and the carbohydrates are produced by green plants in the presence of light. The content is the same. We just rearrange them, the first being active and the second in the passive voice. You can see that even though the content is the same, what is emphasized in each sentence is different. In the first sentence, green plants are emphasized. So if that's what's important, then you write it in this form. But if the carbohydrates that are produced are more important and the thing you want to emphasize, then you use the passive voice. So in, this, in these cases, and you have to be nuanced when you want to emphasize something, and that you can use the passive voice. And finally, when you want to be non-committal or removed from your message, we don't think about it a lot, but every time we want to be more non-committal or removed, we typically use the passive voice in our uh, written uh, in, in written form or in spoken language. So for instance, you will find journals saying your manuscript was rejected because so and so and so. Uh, an academic editor will not say, I rejected your manuscript because so there's always some, some, some removal, some, some distance from the message. These are the most common forms. Okay? Active voice is also okay and preferred these days. So the use of passive declined over the years. And you will see, for instance, a lot of major journals and styles like Science, Nature, the AMA, you know, the APA, the British Medical Journal, and a lot of editors, blogs, magazine articles, and different workshops actually stating in their notice to authors and in their lessons to use we, particularly when you are describing your, your um your uh, results and discussing them. So active is okay and prefer these days. Historically, a lot of the different um, professors will say like, oh, well, this is how it was always done. And you want to distance yourself from, from science, but that's not the case. You know, Good science writing has always existed. And the perfect example for that that I like showing is this 1953 Watson and Crick paper from Nature. If you haven't read it, go read it. It's just about a page long. Uh, a page and an eighth of a, a second page. Uh, and I think it's open access in nature. Uh, it's on the molecular structure of nucleic acids. And in this crucial paper from the 50s, you will see then the first sentence, they write, we wish to, subject, to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid, DNA. And down in the paper, when they discuss it, we wish to push put forward a radically different structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid. So it's not that, that in olden times or a few decades ago, many were writing just in the passive form. You know, good science has always been written. Good science writing has always existed. And so we also need to move forward and push a certain type of writing that would make it easier for 
our readers. Just to end this part, uh, this was something I found from the Language Nerds, which is a, a, a Facebook page about language and publishing. Uh, I recently called an old engineering buddy of mine and asked what he was working on these days. He replied that he was working on aquathermal treatment of ceramics, aluminum, and steel under a constrained environment. I was impressed until upon further inquiry, I learned that he was washing dishes with hot water under his wife's supervision. So you can always complicate things, uh, especially to hide a few things, but you want to be direct, concise, keep it short and simple. So rule one, Think of your audience. Rule number two, kiss. Keep it short and simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Rule number three is to let your story guide you. I'm going to go ask you another question, and you can play with this uh, yourselves too. Uh, first question is, what is the name, uh, first and surname, of the Hogwarts headmaster while Harry Potter was a student, the main one that lasted across many books? Okay, what was his name? Uh, a lot of you will probably know that it is Dumb Abel's Dumbledore. Uh, and if you're a, you're a fantasy geek like myself, you will probably know that the full name is Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. And in the movies and the books, you have a sketch that looks like this. Now, let me ask you, uh, this is the nerd's equation, the nouns equation, uh, used very often in, in redox biology, redox biochemistry. What was nerd's full name? Okay. You probably have used this uh, in your studies uh, and read, uh, whenever you deal with you know, redox uh, equations. Uh, what was Nernst's full name? Uh, and now you'll know that his name is Walter Hamann Nernst, and this is how he looks like, and I hope you remember him. Um, the point here, what's the point with asking these two questions? Uh, my point here is we remember things easily and really well when they are part of stories, particularly when they're part of memorable stories. Okay? Their names get repeated over and over. And more than that, we remember the story as a whole. And we remember no matter how many characters there are in there and how complex things, if a story grabs our attention, we will remember how complex names are and things are, even if it's like Daenerys Targaryen or anything like that. Okay? And so we need to think of, of a story when we are presenting our science. So what we, we need to extend this, this concept of storytelling now when we write our papers. First is ask yourself, do I have a story to tell or is it just all data? Okay. Now, story, stories will vary in terms of length and purpose. You can have an anecdote, you know, a letter, a short story, like a communication for a journal, or a full story, like a, a full paper. And each one of that is fine, and it's a complete story on its own, even though the lengths are different. I'm also not referring here to something that is a journalistic story or sensationalist. That's not what I mean by having a story in science. What I simply mean is having a complete unit with a proper and complete take-home message. And this is what needs to be present in each of your articles. So ask yourself, is your storyline clear when you read the abstract, the conclusions, you know, the results? When I look at the text or I look at the figures and the captions alone, can I take home that can I can I get the take home message from that? And when you read the paper as a whole, is it satisfying because you have a clear take home message and a story that you know, a reader, another scientist will remember? And also importantly, ask yourself, has this story been told before? If it has, then why are you publishing this now? What new things are you adding? What new stories are you telling? Okay? And so ask yourself all the time, instead of having an insufficient background in your introduction, does your paper's intro set the work in proper context? You know, is it sufficient? Instead of having an unclear motivation for your work, it should be clear why the work is being done. And this is something that we find that referees uh, uh, call out again and again. You know, they ask, okay, they say there's good data, there's a lot of good information there, but we don't really know the motivation and why they picked this and why they went along this SAR line and so on. And sometimes that leads to a negative or a neutral evaluation of work. And you don't want that happening. Okay? You also need to check, you know. Do not put in as much data as possible. Put in the data that's pertinent to drive the story. And if there's extra data that would be good to know or is important to know, then ask yourself, is this important to drive the story in the main article or can I just put it in the appendix or the supporting information? Okay? Check that the discussion is not thin, rather that you discuss results well. In the same way when you, when you, do, when you have creative writing, when you're reading it, you want you know, thick, meaty, plot and not something thin. So the same thing will happen. Don't just present your data in a paragraph, discuss your results well. 
instead of thinking that longer papers are better, remember, keep it simple. You want concise and cohesive papers. And finally, instead of having unclear conclusions, when someone reads your paper, particularly your abstract and your conclusions, that should have a clear take home message. Now, the storytelling concept in science can be expanded not just in your individual papers, but also as a whole, as scientists and as communicators. Okay? There's a reason why we like stories. Stories are in our nature. We are hardwired to receive stories, and we are hardwired to tell stories as well. And this is how communities and cultures have learned and have passed down knowledge through the years. And the more important thing to know is that stories move the world. Many decisions in the world are made and many opinions are formed because of particular stories. And we know what's happening in the world right now. And with many issues like the anti-vax movement, everything happening with the virus right now, for us as scientists, we're sometimes baffled as how some, some communities can think one way or the other. And it's not that the scientific data or the backing is not there, it is there, but unfortunately, those on the other side can be better storytellers. So we need to remember that stories move the world, um, but we also know that the only thing that can replace a good story is an even better one. And so the challenge now is for you not just to be good scientists, but also on, on top of producing that good data to be overall good communicators and good storytellers. This thing on the left is something that I see a lot of scientists sharing again and again on Facebook and social media and saying that what refutes science is better science and not your feelings, your, your religion, your politician, or half-baked opinion after watching YouTube videos. And this is true, but we cannot stop and think about this alone as scientists because we do need to be good storytellers. Uh, to be able to help push you know, the good stories and really make the world into a better place, which is what we want to begin with. Okay? So rule one, think of your audience. Rule two, kiss. Rule three, let your story guide you. Rule four is to please your readers. Okay? Just a quick exercise right now. I'm going to flash a paragraph, and the paragraph is an abstract from an actual paper. And I want you to find the topic sentence right now. Okay, stop. Okay. If I ask you now what the paper was about, can you tell me what it's about? Maybe you remember a few terms, you know, irk. Uh, what was the take home message, more importantly? What was the result? And more importantly, why was it important? Why was this done? Okay. You probably wouldn't have been able to take that from that because it was buried right in the middle and all the way at the end. Okay, they perform kinetic studies on representative ERK inhibitors with these potencies and their conclusion that a high affinity slow dissociation inhibitor favors different enzyme conformations depending on the activity state of the kinase. Okay? If you're an experienced reader, you would probably have gone all the way to the end. But what's the problem here? It took so much time for you to find the take-home message of that. Why is that problematic? We need to think about our modern reading audience. Okay? The average attention span a few years back, I think more than a decade, was about nine seconds. I gave you about 15 seconds to find the key message of that abstract. Okay, so that's problematic. If you're looking at a screen, you want to be able to give that, that information in less than 20 seconds to your, to your reader. Also, there's an old study saying that if you write a sentence with, with, that has 12 to 15 words, uh, at first reading, someone will understand that more than 90%, which is great. Another thing that we want to consider is something that, that was studied by psychologists before, which is the serial position effect. Uh, and the serial position effect, is what they did was they, they were looking at um, how, how people recalled words uh, given in a certain order. So if you're asked to memorize a few things uh, in a list, the, the things that people will remember the most, the best in a list, would be the first words, the first few things in the list, and the last things in the li list. It's a, a primacy in the recency uh, effect. Uh, and a lot of communicators also think that this can be applied in, in presentations, and in, in written work, and in oral presentations, that the things that the people will remember the most are the first and the last things that you discuss, which is why you always summarize a few slides, right? And people will forget that big tract in the middle. 
So in the paragraph, in an abstract, the best places for your, for your topic should be the first or the last part. But then if you think, you know, you want to be found, and how do people look for things online these days? You know, a lot of people use search engines. And many search engines will cut titles after a certain number of characters and will cut the meta description, will cut the abstract after a certain number of characters. So this is an example for Google, meaning that if you're key messages are not and keywords are not in the first 60 characters of your title or in the first couple sentences of your abstract, people might just click on the next one, scroll down and look at the next thing. Okay. Another thing that's interesting is what they study when you're looking at uh, something on screen in English, uh, where your eyes go. And this was the F-shaped reading pattern that they discovered, that when we stare at a screen, our eyes go, so, so the, the more red the picture is, the more our eyes stay there. Our eyes go to the top left screen in an English text and go all the way through the first row and so on and so on. But eventually, we don't go through the entire line. We just stay on the left. And so there's an F-shaped online reading pattern. So you want your key messages immediately to be at the top in terms of your abstract. And most readers will not read the entire thing, and many will not even scroll. So remember all of these things. Think of your audience and, and try to please your audience. You know, a sentence is too long if upon reaching the end, your reader cannot remember how your sentence began. Hey, think of breaks in your writing as understanding checkpoints. You can think of humans as very simple beings. We keep on doing things again and again as long as it gives us pleasure. And what gives a scientist and an academic more pleasure than, you know, understanding something. It makes them feel good, makes them feel smart. And so you want to give these packets of understanding, these packets of pleasure to your readers. And how do you do that? You have understanding checkpoints. You have breaks in your paragraphs, in your sentence, and in your entire paper. This is the concept of chunking. So instead of having one big track of text, for instance, in your, in your papers, you can have smaller packets. And you can arrange the packets in such a way that you know, you start with a thesis statement, you have your support, and then you have a new problem and you lead on into a new thing. And so each small packet, each small part of your writing is an immediate take home message to the, uh, to, to the reader. So that even if they stop reading your paper halfway, they would have already taken something important there. And if that important piece of information is what they needed, maybe they didn't need to read the entire paper to be able to cite your work. So give these packets of, informa uh, of information and pleasure to your readers as well. Okay. Editing can work wonders. And let me just end with this, this example. And this is an actual paragraph that I had to copy edit when I was starting as an editor. In the manuscript, the original goal to present a facile, environmental, benign, economical, sustainable, and additive-free synthesis protocol for the fabrication of hollow oxides, which ultimately could enable the fine-tuning of the hollow inorganic materials, has been achieved via sacrificial template-assisted hydrothermal green synthesis strategy through using simple sugar, glucose, and fructose as sacrificial templates. That's uh, six lines, almost six lines, with one sentence, okay? How did I edit that? Okay. Packets of information, packets of pleasure. This article presents a facile, environmentally benign, economically sustainable, and additive-free synthetic protocol for the fabrication of hollow oxides. These oxides could ultimately enable the fine-tuning of hollow inorganic materials. The synthesis was achieved via a facile one-pot hydrothermal strategy with the use of glucose or fructose as sacrificial templates. Same content, exactly the same. The way you, if you rearrange a few things and you have these pauses and you know, uh, chops in your sentences, you're giving these information, uh, making it easier rather. Uh, and even if you're, this is not your specialization, I hope that you probably have taken something away from it. Okay. And this is a nice ending quote uh, from, from Gary Provost, uh, and he wrote this. Uh, the sentence has five words. Here are five more words. Five word sentences are fine, but several together become monotonous. Listen to what is happening. The writing is getting boring. The sound of it drones. It's like a stuck record. The ear demands some variety. Okay. Now listen, I vary the sentence length and I create music. Music. The writing sings. It has a pleasant rhythm, a lilt, a harmony. I use short sentences and I use sentences of medium length. And sometimes when I'm certain the reader is rested, I will engage him with a sentence of considerable length, a sentence that burns with energy and builds with the impetus of crescendo, the roll of the drums, the crash of the cymbals. Sounds that say, listen to this, it is important. 
So write with a combination of short, medium, and long sentences. Create a sound that pleases the reader's ear. Don't just write words, write music. And this is not just true for creative writing. This is true for all writing and all communication. You want to please your reader. Rule one, think of your audience. Rule two, kiss. Rule three, let your story guide you. Rule four, please your readers. And rule five is simple. One slide, be confident. What we mean by this is know what's good about your study and state it, make it explicit. You need to be clear what's good about your study in your cover letter, in your abstract, in your results and discussion, and your conclusions. But beware of overinterpreting your results, overreaching your conclusions, and overselling your work. Again, sensationalist writing, academic writing particularly, is not good, and your editors and your referees will call you out on that. But know what's good about your work and state it. There's a reason scientific journal articles tend to be dry, and it is because we are writing it that way. And so we can change this. And I hope that you do change this. How can you improve your writing? I'm giving you a few links. Check out bit.ly slash good science writing. This is the chemistry views, poster presentation and writing tips. You're going to have lots of exercises there, lots of articles to read, things to download. So try and visit that. If you visit or Google Wiley Author Services, you will find a lot of information for authors and reviewers. going to have a lot of, of different uh, tips that you can use uh, for uh, any publishing topic you can think of. So peer review, open access, and so on. And finally, read. There are lots of different uh, resources you can find. A lot of them are cheap and free online or as printed books. The Elements of Style to help you with English grammar and style on writing well, especially if you're interested too in some creative writing and journalism. The ACS Style Guide is a good uh, uh, resource. I think there's a free version online as well on the ACS websites for it. And there are lots of various online resources on writing. So to end, uh, to summarize, one rule one, think of your audience. It should help determine where you submit, what you write, and how you write it. Kiss, keep it short and simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Simple words and sentences are important and use the active voice when you can. Let your story guide you. Full stories are important, not just spewing out of data. Be a good storyteller in your paper and also when you go out there in the world as scientists. Number four, please your readers. Know and guide your reader. Give them those packets of information and satisfaction. And don't clump everything in one big mess. Give these packets of satisfaction to your reader. And finally, be confident. Know what's good about your work. And don't oversell or overreach your work. But know the good things that you have done and that you want to present to other people. Okay? If you want to contact me, I uh, run this journal, Chem and Chem. Uh, it's a Chemistry Europe journal that's 14 years old. We publish everything related to drug discovery from traditional medchem, nanomedicine, reviews, chem informatics, biologics, and so on. You can follow us on Twitter at chemedchem and chem Europe. And on our board, we have Karl Heinz Altman, who just gave a talk, Atanelamai Sang Yong Yan. And you can also contact me there by email. This is a journal that's part of a big family, which is Chemistry Europe. You might know other journalists like Chem Biochem or chemistry, a European journal. So thank you uh, for having me. Um, I don't know if you can take questions, but I think it'll overlap into uh, the panel discussion, which covers very similar things. And we'll have other great insights uh, from Stuart, Maria Laura, and Eve as well. And you can contact me via those email addresses or uh, the Twitter account of the journal. Thanks, David. Great lecture, really inspiring. And we have time for one question, at least before starting the, the, the session. So uh, Hordi is asking, if you had to choose any of the five points you brought up as the most critical to focus when reviewing a paper, what would you suggest to focus first? Think of your audience. Okay? When you think of your audience again, it'll help you shape the content of your work. Um, and this is important in, in pharmaceutical chemistry. So. If you're a synthetic chemist, you know, and a lot of the, the work that you're writing in your manuscript contains synthetic organic chemistry or synthetic inorganic chemistry there, then, you know, you need to think twice about sending it to a journal that typically publishes a lot of work that requires bio, you know, um, biological mechanisms or cellular work or in vivo work, because that's, you know, immediately that that's the thing that they're going to to ask you about. Uh, it also will help you, you know, shape your writing. You know, who are you talking to? Do you need to explain 
a few things, um, a few more things in your introduction uh, if you're submitting it to a specific journal. So when you think of your audience, it affects a lot of different things. So ask yourself, who is supposed to read this uh, piece of work? You know, who, uh, which are the people in the groups who I want this work to, to, to read it and to cite this work eventually. And I think that's, that's always your number one thing, even before you start writing, because that will also help you form, you know, what experiments do I need? You know, if I want to submit it to to a journal that is read by, you know, by pharmacologists, by chemists, and by biologists, then I can't have just pure synthesis there. I need to have these other things. And so that will also guide your experiments and so on. So the number one rule, really, think of your audience. OK. Thanks, David. 